This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, I have an extra special guest. John Hope Bryant is a fascinating entrepreneur and philanthropist. He is the founder of Operation Hope and one of the leading voices for financial literacy in America. He was vice chair of President Bush's Council on Financial Literacy and sat on a similar uh, Council on Financial Capability for President Obama. He has written five books with more coming. Really a fascinating person who operates in a realm that I think a lot of people in finance overlook. And he's really moving the needle in terms of having people take control of their own financial life in a way that benefits not just them, but the entire economy and all of society. I found our conversation to be just compelling and fascinating, and I think you will also. So with no further ado, my conversation with Operation Hope's John Hope Bryant. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. By the way, my last book is Up From Nothing. That's my favorite one. That's my story of my failures, not my successes. I like that. I yeah. like a, a tale. We tend to learn more mm-hmm. from our our mistakes than we do from our successes, yeah. but we'll circle back to that in a bit. Let's start a little bit with your background. You tell a story in one of your books of a banker who shows up at your <laughs> elementary school class, yeah. and that kick-started your interest in finance? Yes, it was a, a transformational experience to have this banker come in my classroom mm-hmm. on several levels. I had an economics lesson. I had a life lesson. I had an epiphany. I had a race relations lesson. I had a self-esteem and confidence lesson. Those two things finally came together. Huh. I had I had an aha about how the world really works. I figured out how to keep my friends from getting murdered in the streets because when I was nine years old, a year before this class, actually the same year as this class, my best friend George was murdered on a street in Compton with uh, my next door neighbor Tweet selling drugs. Even Uh though he was a a student, he hung out with the wrong character, the wrong kids, and character's not the most important thing in business or whatever, it's the only thing really in culture. Culture then informs character. So culture in my neighborhood was a thug culture. That you you were you were respected if you were you know hard tough guy. a tough yeah. guy and so my friend my best friend who was very very smart did not have good parents like I had who told me I could do anything I wanted to do and who loved me and told me my mother she told me I lo- she loved me every day of my life so there's a difference Barry between being broke and being poor being broke is economic but being poor is a disabling frame of mind a depressed condition of your spirit you must ne- vow never to be poor again so my because i had this this self esteem based on my mother's love and i was i had self love which is not self confidence uh-huh. my 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 next door neighbor Oh, well, my best friend had self-confidence but did not have self-esteem, so he was influenced uh, by those around him. He was murdered. Then when I was seven years old, the guy who saved my life because, long story short, we my mother moved away from my father, uh, arguments over money, domestic abuse involving money. When I was five years old, they fought. She moved. We were staying with her relative to save some money for her first home. The guy who was dating, OC, dating my mother's cousin, saved my life on the front porch when I was swallowing my tongue. And I I just idolized this guy. What I didn't realize was he was ashamed to admit that he could not afford to float the expenses of his immediate family Mm -hmm. and ours. So he went to go sell drugs also part-time. And he was murdered by the drug dealers for whom this was their territory. They came around the corner in a truck, Barry. I'm sitting on the porch waiting for him to come home. I'm seven years old. This is my idol. He saved my life. They hit him in the truck on a bicycle. I can see it in my mind's eye. Wow. They drag him down the street in front of me until he was dead. They did it in front of our house to send a message. And so here's a, you know, these are two stories, maybe three, before I'm nine years old of bad economics, bad culture, and a bad business plan. So now I'm nine years old, Barry, and this banker comes in my classroom. It's home economics class, doesn't exist anymore. Right. He's white. He's white. He has a blue suit, a white shirt, a red tie. He's 6'2. And um, he starts talking about money and free enterprise and capitalism and ownership and, 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 and balance sheets and all this stuff. And I'm sitting there mesmerized. 
You're um, nine years old at the I'm time. I'm nine, and I'm completely entranced. And I remember probably the second or third class, because by the third class I was actually wearing a suit, the only suit I had, <laughs> which was my Sunday suit, to school trying to emulate the suit that I saw this guy in. By the way, this was a crush velvet three-piece suit with a ruffle shirt and a big bow tie. Right. So you can imagine I got beat up when I went to school. <laughs> so I raised my hand, Barry, and I said, excuse me, sir. I had, some, I had enough courage to ask this question. What do you do for a living? And how'd you get rich legally? And Barry, I was, I was dead serious. Like, I was just completely, it was to me, it was a common sense question because everybody in my neighborhood was a thug, a drug dealer, a, a criminal. I, I mean, nobody was, had legit wealth. So, so this <clears> guy's <throat> a banker talking to a room full of nine and 10 years olds. Yeah. How does he answer the question, what do you do for a living and how do you get rich legally? He said, I'm a banker and I finance entrepreneurs. <laughs> and I said, what's an entrepreneur? I've never heard that word my right. entire life. French word, build something out of nothing. Great value. What's an entrepreneur? I mean, no one's ever taught me that. So I went home to the dictionary for those in the you know current generation. It's a Google search. And I opened the, the dictionary to the word entrepreneur and I my whole life changed. And when I came back to school, one more thing. What's a banker? And how many of them are you? And are, did you did you say one more time that your job is to lend people like me to be an entrepreneur money? I can't believe that. So I, I need to get this whole script straight because here my friends were getting murdered and and jailed and shot and all this kind of you know over economics over some you know trying to trying to sell drugs or sell a TV set or whatever it is in the hood hustle up some money instead Hustling. of launching something. That was very foreign to that part of the world. And so when this guy told me there were, at that time, 10,000 banks, <laughs> right. hundreds of thousands of bankers, Were, were there banks bank- in your neighborhood, or was yeah. you, were you an unbanked real? Well, I mean, it was, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was so few you knew where they were, put right. it that way, right? Okay. And this guy was a banker, to be full disclosure, it, it was a banker for Bank of America. Mm-hmm. So I knew what Bank of America was because my mother, it was a big deal to go to the bank and open a passbook account. Or to go there with my mother every couple of weeks, you know, and, and have or my dad to make an appointment with the local the local branch banker might have been the mayor. I mean, he was a very important mm-hmm. guy back in those days. But it was pretty rare occurrence. So, one, I was shocked that there was an industry that was, whose job it was to lend a risk taker money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Two, I was shocked that it was legal. <laughs> Three, I shocked that it was an actual occupation for a guy who's a legitimate hustler. And my whole life changed, and I, I left there. I went, as I said, opened the dictionary. Uh, I started seeing the muffler shop as a business. By the way, there's a difference between an entrepreneur and a businessman is a, or a businesswoman. Those, are, those things are different, different risk tolerance and different business plan. But I started seeing the nail salon as a business. Uh, I started seeing the, I think, the barber shop. The, all these things were businesses. I'd never seen it that way before. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I went back to school, Barry. Sir, your business card. Can I have one? Okay. What's the 16th floor thing? You know there's no floor above the sixth floor in Compton, and that's a courthouse. Right. <laughs> What's on the 16th floor, and where is that at? And by the way, how can you show him coming here in the middle of the day? My mother is in an hourly job at McDonald Douglas Aircraft. She's got two 15-minute breaks in lunch. How is it that you're here in the middle of the day? It's called a salary. You, you have a white shirt. My father wore a blue shirt. How do you keep the shirt clean? Oh, you just do work with mathematics and, and intellectual activities. You don't right. you don't do any dirty work. Um, you know, and how's it that you what's this car that's in the in the parking lot? It's got plates on it and and a tag and and it's brand new. Translation, it's not hot, right? Uh, I mean, and it's beautiful. What do you do? And this world opened up to me, man, and and it, I was done. And so, Mr. Mac, Max Liquor Store. 6'2", also 6'2", black man, owned Max Liquor Store, and I, and I realized for the first time, Barry, this was a businessman. And I went to Mr. Mack. First of all, I, I didn't know there was a black businessman in Compton, so congratulations, Mr. Mack. You're selling the wrong kind of candy. He said, excuse me? Uh, I said, you, you have a liquor store, you're probably good at liquor, but you have a candy uh, rack in the liquor store and you're selling the wrong kind of candy. Go away, little boy. I've got a college degree. That's nice. I've got cavities. You're selling the wrong kind of candy. I'm nine. I'm, at that point, I was 10. So he said, look, you've got a lot of hootspah. Uh, right. I'll hire you. I'm going to put you at the counter. I want you're you to in s- charge of the candy. Right. I said, no. I, I, I declined the offer. He said, I'm going to pay you top dollar for, you know, you come after school, I'm going to pay you. You'll be paid more than any of your friends. I didn't want to do it. And by the way, Barry, this is analogous today 
to the basketball player with a contract, mm -hmm. to the rapper who's, who can sing really well and is rocking a mic, to a baseball player or anybody who is performing at top dollar, but they're cashing the check, they're not writing it. And if you're a great performer, no matter what your industry is, you'll get paid a lot. You may not build wealth, but you'll get a lot of income. Right. I didn't realize what I was doing back then, but I was making a choice. I was like, I don't want to be a performer. I don't want to be your performer. You're the owner, and I get to perform. I don't want that. Tell you what I, I want. Let, make me a box boy. Excuse me? Yeah, I want to do the stocking. He says, the worst job I got. <laughs> That's the one I want. I worked there for three weeks and quit. Because then I know, knew what the wholesale rate was and the retail rate. I knew what the markup was. I knew what supply and demand looked like, what things were moving, what wasn't. I quit. Once I knew where he bought his inventory, he was on the side of the box. I went home, got my mother, I sold my mother on making a $40 investment. Uh, she made me pay her back, by the way, in my new business and went to Smart and Final, an Irish food store, which is where he bought his inventory, and got put in business. And I actually put him out of the candy business not soon after that. I made $300 a week on a $40 investment. Wow. That's amazing. So let's talk a little bit about a quote of yours that's very relevant to this. Persistence and resilience are more powerful than pedigree and raw intelligence. Explain what you mean by that, although I think I have a suspicion as to where that came from. I think, I think that ties directly into what I said about self-esteem and confidence and the mm. difference. It also ties into the, the race relations lesson that I got by meeting this white banker uh, who, who was actually helping me to understand the free enterprise system. So my experience with a white person was different than my the folks growing up. My folks growing up, my friends growing up, they'd get hit hit over the head with a, by a police officer pulling them over. Right. It was a negative experience. As a result of that, they didn't like white people. They didn't trust white people. They didn't want to talk to white people. Mm -hmm. My experience was this banker who basically opened my head up to, to a whole new world. And so I wasn't intimidated by him. I actually found an affinity with him. I didn't want to be him. I wanted to be me, but I wasn't a I was I was not both repost I was either, I was neither repost or you know I wasn't I wasn't trying to be him nor was I trying to avoid him. I thought he was useful mm -hmm. and I and he had a place in my world. So that then relates to um, self esteem. If I don't like me, I'm not going to like you. Mm -hmm. If I don't feel good about me, I'm not going to feel good about you. If I don't respect me, then how can I ever respect you? If I don't have a purpose in my life, I'll make your life a living hell. Whatever goes around comes around. That's self-esteem. Self-confidence is competence put into action. So if I'm competent and I ex execute on that, then I, have, then I have confidence. And that is where my hustle comes from. That's where my resiliency comes from. That self-esteem applied a, with a skill in the marketplace uh, over time, you start taking no for vitamins. You start becoming incredibly resilient, hard to hit. It's hard to hit a moving target, as I said earlier. And and if I don't give up, you can't beat me. When you're asleep, I'm working. When you get up, I'm already I'm already prepared for the day. When you go to, when you're going to chill in the, in the evening, I'm ready. I'm preparing my next business plan. I didn't have compounded capital. I had compounded hustle. And and so I had time. I didn't have money. And I decided to use that time in a way that made me bulletproof or, har or harder to compete with because I was gonna be smarter than anybody else in the room and I was gonna work harder. So I think that resiliency piece, never giving up, never giving in, redefining Barry's success as going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm, mm -hmm. I think that's everything. Let's take the reverse of that because I think this other quote is so telling. The most dangerous person in, in the world is the one with no, no hope. hope. That, that's the flip side of, yeah. of resiliency and, and persistency. What is the challenge when you encounter either a person or an entire region where there's no hope? Man, I really wish we had three hours versus 30 minutes to talk about this one topic because it's everything, Barry. Uh, I won't go down this rabbit hole, but um, at another time we should talk about the, what, why African American experience is different in this country from even Afro-Caribbean, from those from Africa, or other dark people from around the world. Why is the African American experience different? It was how we were treated. And that treatment messed up our head, our mm -hmm. psyche, which is where real wealth sits. So I really like that insight, that your psyche is where real wealth resides. Yeah, that, I mean. I, I've never heard it quite phrased that way. I'll be even more blunt. Uh, 
poverty, sustenance poverty is a roof over your head, food on your on your table, reasonable health care. It's a sustenance, the ability to sustain yourself. All other forms of poverty are mindset based. So whether I believe I can or whether I believe I can't, mm-hmm. I'm right. Uh, <laughs> is the glass half full or is it half empty? Depends who's looking at the glass. So when you tell people for 200, when you enslave them for 270 years, you you destroy their family structure so they have nothing to believe in. You destroy the ability to protect their mate from harm. You, so you destroy their self-esteem and their sense of independent, uh, you know, Agency. Uh, agency. agency, there you go. Yeah. You don't give them education, so they don't know any, they can't don't have a skill set. You don't teach them about the free enterprise system. Um, you basically want to use their body and their mind, their body, uh, because they're agricultural geniuses from Africa. They want them to work this land in the South, but you don't want them thinking, and you certainly don't want them believing. And you do that for 300 years plus, really, two thirds of American experience. It doesn't, you can't help but, but have a depressed group of people. Who who have low faith, low confidence, low trust, who are cynical, not skeptical, mm-hmm. and as a result of that, and who have crappy role models. And if you hang around nine bro people, you'll be the tenth. So now you have a group of people who don't know, but who are smart, brilliant, amazing. When the rules are published and the playing field is level, they excel. Think about the arts. Think about professional sports. Think about politics. Rules are published. Playing field is level. African Americans in this example kill it, but in capitalism and free enterprise. There is no rule book. Mm-hmm. And we were denied that whole lesson. And the best we were taught was how to make the dollar, not to how to build it. Mm-hmm. And so uh, this hopelessness you talk about comes easily from the population that has that experience and who has descendants who are now looking at parents unsuccessful at commercially or economically who did not get a chance or a shot, whose mother was not called Mrs., whose dad was never called Mr. or Doctor or whatever. And so you have these kids who wake up on on a scale of 1 to 10 on anxiety 9, <laughs> right. and uh, they're, uh, on, they're, they're on edge, and you do something to that kid, tap him on the shoulder, he may swing on you, now, now the kid's in jail, <laughs> okay? And so the energy is used for all the wrong stuff. Mm-hmm. And now you start becoming an expert at things that are going to get you locked up. Drug dealing, an underground. So you're, you have genius, you have brilliance. I mean, what's a drug dealer, Barry, if not, I mean, is an illegal, unethical entrepreneur or business person? You understand import, export, finance, marketing, wholesale, retail, customer service, security, territory, logistics. These are not dumb people. They have a dumb business plan. Right. They're an underground economy because they don't trust the mainstream economy. So this hopelessness that you just mentioned is everything for repressing the human spirit. We've got to turn that around. My whole life's work is really summarized in one sentence. To unleash untapped human potential at scale. And you think about if this issue, is racism real? Of course it is. But is that really issue, a question? I mean, come on. No, 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 no. But let's, no, let's no. But here's a twist, and you may have probably never heard this one, African American. But is race the only issue? No. In fact, I'd argue race is not the primary issue today. Today, not not a hundred years ago, not fifty years ago. If it was, Barry, you wouldn't have poor whites. Okay, right. poor whites who are segregated from wealthy whites right. economically. You would not have uh, African Caribbeans. And Africans from Africa who actually do better in some ways mm-hmm. than African Americans on ownership issues. If if was, if she was just race, all whites would be immensely successful. Right. All blacks would be immensely repressed. You have these subsectors because mindset has it provided a differentiated path. Huh. So what I am saying is you can level the playing field with a business plan based on hope. Let's talk a little bit about what Operation Hope does, but I want to start by asking, why don't we teach financial literacy in school? Why isn't this a core course offering across the entire country? A couple of very practical reasons. Um, Number one, a school district is a business. (laughs) And like every business, they want revenue, and they'd like to have a surplus profit. What they don't want is an unfunded mandate. Mm -hmm. And as well-meaning as financial literacy is, it's got two problems. One, it doesn't have a budget allocation from Congress. Uh, And the Department of Education does not set curriculum. 
they're a budget, they're a, they're a check writing organization. They, they give you criteria at right. the state and the local level, and they give you money. They incentivize you with grant payments from the, from the federal government to meet that criteria. Um, the school, there's no, there no funding base for financial literacy. I got tre- President Bush, George W. Bush, to make financial literacy the policy of the U.S. federal government. I was naive, Barry, because I thought, I didn't realize that when he inserted the word federal government, that just meant government employees. That, mm-hmm. that, that, meant, the, that meant the federal government. I also was naive by thinking that if I wrote a letter, which I, he allowed me to do, with Charles Schwab, we wrote a letter, he was, Charles Schwab was chairman, I was vice chairman, to every one of the, the 14,000 school district superintendents that was around in 2000, I think it was nine or 10, that they school districts would just see the White House letterhead and understand the nobleness of this work. Right. And, oh my God! Of course, we'll to get on it. this right yeah. away. Crickets. I got not. We got. Not, <laughs> we got not one response. Really? It, it, yeah, not one response. Zero. A Zero. letter goes to every school district on White on House. On White House stationery signed by the chairman and vice chairman of the President's Council on Financial Literacy. Crickets, because it was an unfunded, mandate gotcha. in their view. And they're like they're they're shaking the paper, going, yeah. "Hey, this is nice, but where's the cash? Where's the check? Is there a check right. attached to this?" And number two, um, and I think that they were like, "I'm sure there's another a note coming after this with a congressional allocation," and right. it never came. Number two, money is emotional. Yeah. So money, unlike math, money is highly emotional, and people want to spend money. They don't want to talk about it, including teachers. Superintendents, school board members, city council people, members of Congress. People are have most people have too much month at the end of their money. Um, <laughs> too much month at the end of their money. Yes, sir. Yeah, that they're, makes sense. They're living from paycheck to paycheck. Seventy percent right. of the U.S. economy. It's been recently shown. I think it was a Bloomberg report actually that half of all people in this country making a hundred thousand dollars a year, paycheck to paycheck, two, a third of those making a quarter million dollars a year living from paycheck to paycheck. So this is not just poor people, it's now almost everybody is struggling with cash flow, but they wanna look good, they wanna look successful, they wanna go on a vacation, they wanna go shopping. So they, so people think, they'd like to think that credit cards are cash, and they don't want anybody to disavow them with that belief. I can't be broke, I still have checks left. <laughs> right, dis- right. They wanna be able to say yes to their children, yes to their wives or spouse. That, that insecurity, if you will, of wanting to say yes and live the life conflicts with a budget, conflicts with a limit, conflicts with having to sit down and understand if your outflow exceeds your inflow, then your overhead will be your downfall. This was my dad's problem. Uh, my dad thought the cash flow was profit. He was he had a construction company and he bid a job at $1,000. It cost 1200 but he'd outbid the other guy who was bidding the job for 1400 right. He thought he was successful. Well, the more you, if, if you live that way, you make a dollar, spend a dollar fifty. the more money you make, the broker you get. So we he by the end of my dad's life, I was taking care of a man who had a gas station, an eight unit apartment building, a, a, our own home, a nursery business, a cement contracting business. I probably missed a couple, but he lost it all, all of our generational wealth, because when you don't know better, you can't do better. Mm-hmm. And and my dad didn't know what he didn't know. Goes back to what I was saying earlier about that slave experience. My dad's dad was a sharecropper probably born into slavery in 1871 in Mississippi, was certainly a sharecropper. My dad was a businessman. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm obsessed with financial literacy because I think it's the civil rights issue of this generation. Say that again. Uh, Financial literacy is the civil rights issue of this generation. That's a fascinating take on that. Go into more detail about that because I've never, again, I've never heard anyone quite hone in just that way. Look at where we are right now in the in, in the center of one of the wealthiest cities in the wealthiest country in the world and in the center of a studio made by an entrepreneur right and this whole thing works on money this whole city works on money it sets public policy in many ways in the world because it's the center of money the even slavery real talk was about money of course Everything that's not about God or love is probably about money. But do we understand money? What did I say about how, I mean, Malcolm X said, we've been bamboozled, we've been tricked, we've been fooled. Uh, You can say 
uh, you know, what Andrew Young said, who's Dr. Dr. King's right arm, that to live in a system of free enterprise and not to understand the rules of free enterprise must be the very definition of slavery. Huh. So if you're in a system and you don't understand how it works and you think that cash flow is profit or getting that bag, getting that dollar, getting that money is actually going to advance you when in reality inflation is outrunning your ability to even compete on a, on a wage basis. Right. You're not going to build wealth. You may have a lifestyle, but you build wealth in your sleep. In your sleep, that's mm-hmm. compounding. But 41% of black folks own a home. 75% of white folks own a home. There's a delta, 35, 30, 35% of natural home ownership the black folks are missing because no one taught, gave us a memo on money and wealth creation. We don't own stocks. We don't own bonds. We're not starting businesses with, with, with employees and technology. 96% of black businesses don't have an employee. I mean, and how do you build a business in, how do you build wealth in America? Business, how do you build wealth in America? Business creation is mm-hmm. a a, a primary portal. That's what my Jewish friends did it, by the way, is is to level the playing field in an unlevel world is they became owners uh, and that became, gave them a different version of social justice. Um, and, and I think that's a model, by the way, for African Americans and other groups trying to come up from nothing. To me, the color is not white or black. It's not red or blue. It's green. Mm-hmm. Actually, as, as in the color of U.S. currency. Barry, it's always been green is my point. But we just never got the memo. That's my book, the third book, I think. So let's keep this at the school level. How do we teach financial literacy in schools? How do we get that funded? And at what grade should we be starting that process? We should be starting as early as possible. Um, Fifth grade, sixth grade? uh, Kindergarten. Uh, Really? Yeah. Yes. Nice thing, yeah. we have we, Operation Hope is the official kids accounts manager mm-hmm. uh, for the Atlanta public school system, and the Atlanta City Council funded us uh, a few million dollars to open kindergarten accounts. Um, Meaning what? What do what do kindergartners get through Operation Hope? Underprivileged kids in kindergarten will get a bank account, a savings account to start for fifty bucks. Right. We will match it for fifty bucks. And then wrap financial literacy around that for every kid in kindergarten all the way through middle school. And the reason that this is so important is studies have already proven that if a kid has a bank account at kindergarten, they're half as likely, sorry, 50% likely to go to college. If you have money. 50% more likely to go to college just because you have a bank account in kindergarten. That's right. An aspiration, a target. Is that driven because the family has money? Or is it driven because of a whole philosophical viewpoint that, oh, I understand how the economy works, how how the market works, and I want to advance myself? It's what you said earlier, Barry. It's the difference between being broke and being poor. The difference Mm -hmm. between sustenance, poverty, and mindset. Now your mindset is is connecting the dots between education and aspiration. Why am I going to school? What's the point of all this? Oh, I have a bank account. What's the point of the bank account? Oh, the bank account's tied to a salary or, 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 right. uh, okay, now, okay. So this, uh, oh, so I mean, it's economy. a whole financial world that you might not have known about otherwise. And your mind opens up, right? Huh. And so, and if you, and you're two thirds more likely to graduate from college if there's money in the account. This is unbelievable. Huh. It's, and it's, it's so low ho- hanging fruit. It changes the endorphins in the right side of your brain where hope, well being, faith, confidence, joy. And what did it, what it slavery rob? It robbed hope. It robbed self esteem. It robbed belief. It robbed confidence. Now you've gone from a, survi- from a thriving and a winning mentality to a surviving mentality where y- your life is ready, fire, aim. And now the world's got you distracted with your survival and your surviving. Now you're not competing with the capitalists. And what this does is get people at the bottom of the wrong competing with the capitalists, which is, by the way, what this country needs every 100 years is a new Henry Ford. Mm -hmm. This country needs a new Steve Jobs or a new Tony Ressler or a new, you know, whoever your hero or shero is. This country needs, every big business wants a small one. Goldman Sachs, there's a guy named Goldman and a guy named Sachs selling financial services door to door. Where's the black version of that? Where's the Latino version of that? Where's the Indian version of that? Where's the poor white version of that? By the way, NASCAR came from moonshine runners. Right. In the Appalachian Mountains, these guys realize, I can't keep running from the police and selling moonshine, but I drive really well. That's NASCAR. We have to legitimize the hustle. The right business model, not not an illegal one. That's it. Pennies. That's what happened to me with that banker in my classroom. So it has to be, you can't just be a curriculum, Barry, on the, your point of how to teach it. It has to be a real-life exploration of, of connecting education with aspiration, 
it has to be life experiences that the kid and the parents and the family can relate to. And you have to have a role model that experiences that, that with that, te- that kid in the classroom who looks like the person that we're trying to emulate, mm-hmm. right? So you need that banker or that entrepreneur or that business person or a Barry or a John to come in at least, you know, three or four times during the coursework to ignite the endorphins in this guy's, this kid's, male or female's, head about, wow, I, by the way, it's role modeling. This is who I could be because because in your and my household, my guess is there's somebody in the household mm-hmm. who we could emulate. But most of these kids, 70% of black households don't have a man at home. So and your, your mother is working two jobs, so you don't see her. She's trying to keep the lights on. You don't see a positive role model who's male. Right. So where's your role models? In the streets. <laughs> I mean, it makes perfect sense. So why are you being a rap star? Why do you want to be a rap star, an athlete, or a drug dealer in the hood? Because that's what you see. Right. So we've got to give kids something different to see. This could literally reset everything. And I believe you do this right in urban black and brown neighborhoods, white, poor, rural neighborhoods, struggling, actually, working class neighborhoods. You add 2 to 3% of GDP in 5 to 10 years for America as a country because the bottom of the pyramid gets rehabilitated. You put that you get them back in the game of economic cre- uh, value creation. You get the credit score up through our coaching at Operation Hope, which is, we're raising credit scores at Hope, mm-hmm. fifty four points in six months, one hundred twenty points in twenty four months. Nothing changes your life more than God or love than moving your credit score one hundred twenty points. Right. We're reducing debt by thirty five hundred bucks in a year. We're increasing savings five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars in that same year for somebody making forty eight thousand dollars a year. This is Operation Hope. This uh-huh. is what you're doing. Yeah. So let's talk about. Where you operate, how many people you reach. Just started in Atlanta. Yeah. No, Wait. no, started in South Central Los Angeles. Oh, okay. So it started on the West Coast. Rodney King Riots, 1992. That's what, that was the initial motivation. Yeah. We, yeah. The new what, work what started in, you, in Atlanta. Okay. What brought you to Atlanta originally? Andrew Young. Uh huh. Andrew J. Young, ambassador, mayor, civil rights icon, Andrew J. Young, the guy who was on the balcony with Dr. King mm-hmm. when he was assassinated in 68. He became a mentor and a role model to me. He was the only black man, one of two, who were who was international when I was 20, 25 years old, who happened to be black. I was like, I want to be an international businessman. The the other being who? Quincy Jones. Uh huh. Now this is sad. Here I have, I don't have like a you know in this example, I don't have a Bloomberg as my role model, who's a businessman, or a Tony Rest, or whoever your or Michael mm-hmm. Argetti, whoever your you know mindset is, like Henry Kravitz, or whatever. I had you know a, a entertainment. Uh, genius, Quincy Jones, and I had uh, a civil rights icon, Andrew Young. So here here you go again. We're, I'm starving for role models. I, I went with what I had. But right. the only two international people I knew at that time who were black were these two icons. You could do worse than Quincy Jones and Andrew Young, right? I could do worse. Not 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 bad role models, just not enough of them. And, they be, and not rightly positioned in capitalism and free enterprise. Mm-hmm. Not squarely. By the way, they would admit it. Um, and so uh, I became good friends with Quincy Jones, mm-hmm. and I became dear, almost family with with Andrew Young. Thank God, uh, it changed my life. And so I remember Quincy told me, "If you think you're in the music business, and you don't own music rights, publishing rights, <laughs> licensing you're not rights, in the music business. you're just a temporary performer." Right. And um, I've already given you a quote from Andrew Young, which shows you. I mean, he's built the he built the tenth largest economy in the country, the only international city in the South, Atlanta, Georgia, mm-hmm. on the bones of diversity and inclusion as an economic model. Uh, and, and, and of course, you know, we can see today that the moral capital in America, which is Atlanta, is also the largest economic engine in the South, built on, like New York, diversity and inclusion and good common sense. So I moved to Atlanta for a number of reasons, but I remember one conversation in particular, Barry, uh, there was a city of, uh, there was a mayor, I don't want to mention his name, but there was a mayor in, in, in L.A. who saw me as a threat about my age. And uh, um, he asked me to schedule a meeting with Andrew Young because he knew that Andrew, was my, my, Andrew Young was my mentor. I did that. There was a meeting in L.A. and I was, I was sitting on the floor because this particular mayor was sending a message to me. There was no seat for me, so I sat on the floor. It's fine with me. I didn't, I didn't care. And... Um, uh, and by the way, I should say for the audience, this was so they don't want to try to guess this. This was 20 years ago, so nobody thinks it was recent. And after the meeting, Andrew Young was at the airport, and he said to me, you know you got to move out of L.A. <laughs> <laughs> 
either they see you as a threat and think you want to become mayor or they're going to treat you like a child for the rest of your life because you grew up here. And he said, John, a prophet is only without honor in his hometown. That's biblical. Mm -hmm. And he said in in Atlanta, they called Dr. King in Atlanta, uh, Marty, ML, uh, Michael, his original name. They were digging at him. That's why staff called him Dr. King to give him gravitas at 28, 30 years old. He was only 5'7". Dr. King was 5'7", 160 pounds. So uh, he was like, we had to give him some gravitas. You got to move out of this city and come back as an honored citizen later on. He was completely right. Um, and, and the other thing was, you know, history in L.A. is two years old. I don't mean as a diss. I mean, L.A. is a place where you reinvent yourself. Constantly. Right. Constantly reinvention. So it's great for an entrepreneur who's trying to make it. Well, I had already made it to a certain degree. What I was looking for now was purpose. And Atlanta was steeped in purpose and civil rights history. So I went there and created civil rights, from civil rights in the streets to civil rights in the C-suites. This is an extension of Dr. King and Andrew Young's unfinished work, an extension of what Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass were doing in 1865 with the Freedmen's Bank. It was, a, it was an extension from the streets to the suites, a discussion about green, free enterprise, capitalism, economics, ownership, and wealth creation at scale to set people free using the free enterprise system. So let me, let me jump in here. We, we, we're talking about Atlanta. You, you set up Operation Hope or you expand Operation Hope in Atlanta. Um, how many students are you reaching and how large would you like to see this get? So the student piece is, is cool, um, but it's almost like a pilot project given all my larger work. I mean, it's 50,000 kids in the Atlanta public school mm-hmm. system. So you can do the math there. You know, we, we've got... We got 10% of that in the kindergarten kids as a target. But a million, we taught a million kids financial literacy. That's still to be very small uh, beans worth our target. There are 40 million black people in this country. There are 100 million blacks and poor whites um, uh, in this country. You have 130 million people who are financially bruised in this country, including working class, middle class uh, people. My goal is to become America's financial coach. My goal is to become the Starbucks of financial inclusion, the Walmart of financial literacy at scale, the Federal Reserve of the hood. I have 245 locations today, Barry, Uh, 245 locations in 46 states. How many people in total have you worked with through Operation Hope? We've had over 4 million clients, and we have 245 locations in 46 states. We're the largest financial inclusion and financial literacy coaching organization in the country. Uh, We are... um, uh, inside also, well, we're the only nonprofit allowed to operate inside of a bank branch in U.S. history. We're the only nonprofit in Fortune 500 companies doing financial coaching for employees, including Delta Airlines, all 90,000 of their employees, so much so that Delta CEO has given a $1,000 emergency savings account to everybody who goes through our financial coaching work, all of his 90,000 employees. Wow. That's how much he believes. I can't go to a Delta uh, terminal without people talking about their financial coaching and the $1,000 savings account that they've gotten. I can't go to an airport without a TSA agent screaming out their credit score. Um, <laughs> what You've worked with TSA and all their staff members doing no, this? Or? These, these are just my clients who <clears throat> happen to yeah. be working at TSA. But we are a coach for UPS. We are a coach for Harley Davidson. We are a coach for the Venetian Hotel employees in Las Vegas. We are a coach, I've already mentioned Delta Airlines. We have a big, I can't mention it, but there's a big company today, one of the big, probably the, one of the top five employers in the country has just signed up with us. So we're in banks, whether it's Truist or Wells Fargo or Bank of America, they've ordered over 100 branches from us. Uh, you know, that's business. 100 branches is, is a business mm-hmm. decision, not a charity decision. And we're getting the bank out of the no business, Barry, and back into the yes business. In other words, if I can get your criteria sort it, get your savings account up, get your debt down, get your credit score up, the bank can say yes. That's an attractive customer to anybody. Voila. Yeah. So I, that's why I'm saying this is a business case, not a charity case that we're making. So so let, let me focus on the financial literacy side. There's been some academic research that shows financial literacy as a tendency to fade over time. How do you keep this front of mind with people? How do you not let the hard-won one skills atrophy over time put your credit score on your phone let's start there <laughs> because it lives really? oh my god yes it's like it's like a complete living barometer of how you're doing we have a credit score index that's powered by Experian as an example their data from Experian 
I've measured every zip code in America by credit score. You tell me your zip code, I'll tell you how you're living. The average credit score within a zip code will give you a standard of living for that space, for that region. Oh, it'll tell you how long you're going to live. Really? Mm-hmm. That's pretty impressive. So in a 580 credit score neighborhood, you live to 61. That doesn't sound like very attractive life. Social man. security is 65. Yeah. Uh, in a 580 credit score neighborhood, uh, you'll have a high school education. 61% of people, I'm sorry, 61% of people have a high school education in one parent household. These are the averages in a 580 credit score neighborhood. In a 580 credit score neighborhood, the violent crimes per thousand is off the charts. Uh, the the uh, All the negatives explode. Home ownership level is sub 40%, 20%, right. 25%. Unemployment? Unemployment's through the roof. Uh, it's all predictable, right? You go into a 700 credit score neighborhood of any race, now that's good, but that what do credit scores go to like eight twenty? Yes, but anything above seven hundred is free. Is fine, yeah. Uh, banks say say yes to you at seven hundred. Mm-hmm. You go to seven hundred, Barry. You live to eighty one years old. Wow, ten minutes away. Uh, Chicago, these credit, these zip codes are ten minutes away. In I mean, most cities, uh, Manhattan's a borough, so it's slightly different. But most cities, these zip codes are ten minutes away. These realities. So a, a seven hundred credit score neighborhood. You live to ninety, sorry, to eighty-one plus. You have a high school graduation rate of over ninety percent. They're going to college. You have two parent households. Violent crimes are non-existent. I mean, it's a complete different reality. world. So here's what you see in a five eighty credit score neighborhood, right? Check casher, right. next to a payday loan lender, next to a rent to own store, next to a title lender, next to a liquor store, next to a pawn shop. And by the way, Barry, this is not just black and brown urban. Neighborhoods, it's poor, it's poor white. white, rural. Yeah. So you got me. I, you finished the sentence for no, me. I, I'm it, I'm very well aware that people seem to be, you know, whenever we look at uh, entitlement spending and and some people think there's a racial component. The biggest consumer of government assistance poor are, are poor rural whites in America. And That's, the number one group dying in America is a white high school educated white man who dying of essentially of drug de- overdose, op- op- yeah. opioid addiction, huge, depression. Huge. My, so what I'm doing is taking the emotion out of this conversation. I believe I love math because it doesn't have an opinion. That's a Melody Hobson quote. Um, and if I can replace the emotion with a science, uh-huh. with a mathematical equation, with a credit score, okay, and that credit score changes, it's dynamic. It changes you know, every week. That keeps your attention. <laughs> That keeps you, that's a, it's an individual scorecard. I can't, here's what's beautiful if you're an underserved person or somebody who's used to being, used to racism dogging you or sexism dogging you. I can't get in your heart and change how you feel about me. Mm-hmm. I can get into my own head and change my credit score. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's control of my own destiny. And the credit score is a trending indicator for all other things, hope, faith, Belief, confidence, well-being, trust. These things you need to access banking, financial services, uh, uh, market economy, investors. Uh, So I believe that we found a burning bush. You move. I'm going to say something on your podcast that I rarely say to anybody. You move credit scores 100 points in this country. You stabilize this country. Mm -hmm. We're talking unemployment. Poverty, crime, health, health, and life expectancy, all, uh, all tied to a credit score. Plus economic vitality, prosperity, business creation, uh, uh, stable families. Uh, five, I've got five pillars of success in my, my newest book, Up From Nothing. Here's the five things you need to succeed. Uh, uh, as much education as you can shove down your throat. Mm-hmm. Understanding financial literacy, how the economy works, the math of the matter. Family structure and resiliency, self-esteem and confidence, role models in the environment. You have five of those things, you're going to be immensely successful. You have four of those things, you're going to be very successful. You have three of those things, you will pop your head over failure. You have less than three of those things, you're stuck. Who has less than three of those five things? Poor whites, African Americans, Native American Indians. So you were recognized by Oprah Winfrey's, quote, Use Your Life Award, and you were also named American Bankers Innovator of the Year Award. What do these recognitions mean to you, given 
what you've done in your life to move the needle for so many people? You combine those recognitions with um, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies today suggesting that I'm a conscience on capitalism, which uh, several uh, big-time CEOs have said, including the CEO of Walmart and Delta, et cetera. And it says this is a bit of my... This is my version of a Nobel Peace Prize, mm-hmm. it, 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 which is really a gateway or a substitution clause for having this conversation with mainstream power structure. When you have these recognitions, it allows you, it, it gives you entree into a door or doors in the C-suites where you can have a conversation as a peer, as mm-hmm. an equal. So I'm not talking at people anymore. I'm talking with people. And they understand they have value and they have credibility and success, but they also value in a different way my credibility and success. And I've had enough private sector success also uh, in growing and building enterprises. They, they, they know I'm a legit capitalist. I mean, I've, I've clipped a coupon on Wall Street. I've done, I've run a balance sheet in and in a, in an income statement, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's respect in, in consideration, not just for my beliefs, but for what my I have uh, I guess what we have built and how we performed, which allows us to have a conversation that's different, um, that allows us to create a coalition of the willing of leaders, which we're building now. I mean, CEO of Walmart and I are co-chairing financial literacy for all, um, Doug McMillan. Our goal is to get uh, 80% of the Fortune 500 by 2025 to embed financial literacy into its business plan, not to its philanthropy plan, its business plan, just like healthcare was 40 Years ago, so our mission in schools is to get financial literacy funded by Congress, K through college. So to answer that question you mentioned earlier, I'm vice chairman of No Labels now. As of two months ago, uh, my mission there is to be the voice of the underserved and the voice of the voice. Let's try to get public, get 58 to be very practical. Get 58 U.S. senators to agree on a bipartisan basis to pass the civil rights bill of this generation, financial literacy. Then, in, then that'll get us into schools, and, I'm, and I've got a plan for the the the, uh, the banking and financial services system. I mentioned that hope inside. I've got a plan for workplace, uh, which I've just discussed. But hope, but financial literacy for all is really about building this culture amongst Fortune 500 companies, which is where you spend most of your time working, uh, well, living. If you're, you know, you spend most of your time at work if you're mm-hmm. an employee, and changing the culture in the places that change America. So let's talk a little bit about Promise Homes. Where did this idea come from, and, and what's the company's purpose? And and to reiterate, this is a for-profit company. This mm-hmm. is not a right. philanthropy. It's a for-profit company, and coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous, I guess. I wanted to build wealth uh, for myself so that I did, did not have to continue to go begging to a philanthropist to help Operation Hope mm-hmm. with its growth. I wanted to be able to reach into my own pocketbook and to write my own check, which meant I needed assets. I needed a business that didn't conflict with Operation Hope. So there's a lot of things I couldn't do. I couldn't do banking, couldn't do brokerage, I couldn't do a lot of things. Single family residential rentals was a business I thought I could be in that had no conflict with my philanthropy. Mm -hmm. It also, oddly enough, Barry, was a business that Frederick Douglass was in. Oh, really? Uh Uh-huh. He owned $6 million worth of real estate, rental real estate in Baltimore, Maryland. That gave, he rented it out to working class blacks that gave him the financial freedom to be a uh, civil rights leader and an abolitionist. People don't know that story, but he was a capitalist. And actually, Frederick Douglass ran the Freedmen's Bank for Abraham Lincoln in 1865 that was chartered to teach free slaves about money. So he was both a financial literacy uh, champion. Pioneer. Yeah. Pioneer, and he was an asset owner. And in many ways, I am literally replicating his business huh. model. But it wasn't intentional. This is just sort of tripped on to this uh, same narrative. So so let's talk about this business model a little bit because private equity has moved into this space. There've yeah. been lots of criticism that big money is pushing out smaller potential home buyers. Tell us a little bit about how Promise Homes operate, where are you operating and how large do you want to get this? So I I um I I think that this can be a game changer. And um there I mean some of this criticism is legitimate that a lot of folks who own these homes are sitting in office buildings pushing a, a, a basically a financial formula. They're not connecting this to the emotions of somebody's most pr- prized asset, which is where they live. They're not they're not connecting this to 
um, the human experience, and they probably shouldn't be in the business of of owning homes in low wealth neighborhoods unless they are fully committed beyond a balance sheet investment. Mm-hmm. You'll get your return, but but really, should you be? Should this be, this be the business that you're in if you don't really care? We care, and um, let me go back a little bit. Uh, story because the orig- origin story is a little interesting. I went to Tony Ressler of Aries Management and. And Michael Argetti had this. I had this idea. So Michael said he's going to put up a few million bucks to partner with me. And I went to go see Tony about supporting Operation Hope, and I get asked him for fifty thousand dollars. He said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's in your other pocket? Excuse me." He said, "Look, you got fifty thousand dollars out of me philanthropically, but you're a smart guy. What are you making in the other pocket? Because you just took money out of my out of my left pocket." <laughs> I, so I said, "Well, I got this business idea." He said, "I'm in." And, just like that. Yeah, I'm S- in. Uh, sight unseen. You didn't even pitch him. No, yeah, I shared my vision. And three okay. minutes into it, he said, that makes sense to me. I'm in. I said, well, you can't be in. Uh, I've already got a partner. Well, who's your partner? Tell him who it was. Well, he works with me. Tell him I'm in. About a week later, I'm in New York, and we're having a conference call. He said, I've thought about this. Why do three million when you can do 30 million? It's a great idea. Why do 30 million when you can do 130 million? Let's do 130 million. And we built this company over five years from zero to 120 million. And I paid uh, all the bankers off, all the, the Fairdie Mac, City National Bank, the, these other banks, uh, First Republic Bank. I paid Tony and Michael off plus their coupon. I was so proud uh, to be a black man in America who came from nothing. And I paid all of my debts off dollar for dollar under agreement. And I owned the company. And, and I was teaching, and, and we did this honorably because I was doing financial literacy for the residents. Mm-hmm. Free financial literacy. If you made your payments on time, we rewarded you. If you had a credit score of 600 or 580, you had to go into financial counseling and coaching with my organization, Operation Hope. If you raise your credit score to 700, I would reduce your rent by 10%, and t- as long as you kept the credit score above 700. Um, we made sure that the vendors that did the work on maintenance, plumbing, heating, lighting, landscaping, roofing, et cetera, that, they, that we gave a shot to minority and women-owned businesses. So 55% of all of my merchants, my vendors, were minority and women. If I was not a black guy owning this company, I don't think anybody else would have done that. I was sensitive to it because, of course, I am it. Mm-hmm. And then we gave a path to home ownership from rent to own for people who said, I love this experience. I've been paying rent on time. Can you help me become a homeowner? That caught the, the attention of the media. And so media starts saying, well, is this a model of going from rent to own? And can you actually treat people like residents and not just renters? And can this business be a, a, also a catalyst for social justice through living wage jobs and contracts? The answer to those questions were all yes. That also, those three things allowed me to access different kinds of capital pools than Wall Street were accessing that were cheaper. So uh, without getting into a bunch of detail, I found another capital stack that was multiples less expensive than the hot money on Wall Street, and there's two ways to make money. You make more, you spend less. I was spending less. That allowed me to sell my business uh, at a prime rate, and then uh, I then became an advisor to KKR and their global real estate group because of the philosophy that I had at Promise Homes Company. And now I've sold that company into a partnership, but I'm growing that company now with the new partners, uh, Sean Horowitz and, and Clayton Wyatt. We're gonna now scale this company from 700 homes to 10,000. And I want to own all of these affordable housing homes that are in the institutional portfolios. I want them to sell those homes to me, let me treat them as a priority, as these are the communities that I love. And I think you can do well and do good, too. In fact, I know you can. So here we have a philanthropic model with Operation Hope, financial coaching. And you have a wealth creation and a job creation and, and, and home ownership model, affordable choice model with Promise Homes Company. And at some point, I'll get into access to capital. That's another conversation for another day. But I, this is my mechanism to uplift the bottom of the economic pyramid. And it's a for-profit company. What cities uh, do you want to expand it to? It's national. I'll go every place but those places that are literally unaffordable for, um, for rents. Uh, I'm not you know, you can't do it in Manhattan. Uh, but you can do it in the, some of the boroughs. You, mm-hmm. uh, you, you, can, you can't do it in L.A. proper, but you can do it in some of the uh, cities around that. Beyond that is almost every place in America uh, does have slots for affordable housing. What I want to do, I mean, there's only half, there's about 500,000 homes that are owned institutionally out of 17,000 rental homes. So the, the concept that institutions are Wall Street's owning Main Street is in and of itself a fallacy, 
But is it true that most of the sales in the last few years have been been from institutions? That is true in these underserved neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I want to do is buy the port the the homes that have less than a two thousand dollar a month rent from these institutions. I want to own them, and I want to buy uh, or build homes in other neighborhoods that have you know sub two thousand dollar rents. So let's address both of those. First, are these big companies willing sellers? Do they want to sell? I don't know where that falls in their range, but mm-hmm. sub two thousand isn't the top of their range. So right. They want to get rid of these. Well, f- frankly, that's how Operation Hope started. That's how the Promise Homes Company got started. Um, in Was sub two thousand or the bottom of the range? And institutions that w- did not really think this was a sweet spot for their portfolio. This mm-hmm. was so you had the two thousand eight two thousand nine economic crisis. Right. Uh, they had investors come into their funds to buy assets in a downtown downturn, five or seven years later, the investor wants out. It's not that they don't like the asset, but they're like, we've they hit our- return. I wanna, sure. yeah, we hit our bogey, we're done. I was at the door in 2016, knocking on the door, good saying- Good timing. Good timing. And I bought some of these assets um, at a decent rate uh, when they were trying to exit. And, and even if they didn't want to exit their whole portfolio, the one part that they were willing to get rid of was this bottom section. I think we're at that point again. I think. With where the economy is right now, the next two years, there'll be a pruning, a refinement, mm-hmm. a tightening of uh, institutions' business plans, focusing on their sweet spot. And their sweet spot, to be blunt, Barry, is somebody like you and me who has multiples of income over their expenses. They're mm-hmm. looking for that renter. They don't want a renter who has three times rent, which is a low-income, low-wealth renter. They don't want somebody who's a, a doctor, I'm not a doctor, a Walmart manager or the you know, McDonald's manager or the police officer, but I do. <laughs> I want them. I, I want, I love these communities. I love these residents as my, uh, you know, occupants. I love these neighborhoods that are untapped, underserved, and unseen. And I think my passion for these neighborhoods matches with the strategic interests of institutions who've hit their bogey. They've hit their number. And um, the homes are not deferred. They've been rehabbed. Mm-hmm. But it's headline risk, maybe, for somebody to own it other than me. Let, let me let me own it, do well and do good. What what about building homes? You mentioned you want to start doing construction. Is there enough land around? There's lots of regulatory restrictions. There's mm. lots of NIMBY mm. where people don't want lower income housing in their neighborhood. How do you operate around that? Uh, you go into existing inner city neighborhoods and you find bum properties. You find property with a tree in the roof or with a, mm-hmm. the, 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 what's the worst house or houses on the best blocks. They're you know crime infested or they're a magnet for problems. Partner with the city <laughs> right. and say, hey, city council person, hey, you know. We want to take this off your hands. We want to help you. Can you help us? Oh my God, sure. <laughs> and you buy it, right? You rehab it with minority vendors, which is what we're doing. And you then either put it back into inventory as affordable rent or you sell it to mm-hmm. somebody in the neighborhood. We have all those relationships. We have the credibility. We've got the street cred and the institutional cred uh, to get that done. And we're trusted. We're the honest broker in these neighborhoods because they know me. They've seen me there for 30 plus years. So I'm not I'm not selling wolf tickets, as they say. And when you say national, is this a city by city approach or do you roll it out? All at once. No, you, you. I think it's both. You, you. When you, when you, if you're buying portfolios, you may find that you bought portfolio homes in six cities. So now, as long as you have enough cities to have property management, that's really the key. You want to have centralized property management uh, in a city, so you can so you can keep the promises to the residents. I mean, I've learned a lot in this business. Like I, I, one thing I've learned is that no one washes rental cars. Right. Like if you don't own it, if you're the property management company, you don't own it. So you're not gonna have the same care for these residents as as I would as the owner of the prop of the property it's myself and so you may let that resident call you six or eight or ten times and not go out to them you may you you may overcharge on maintenance because you can Mm -hmm. so there is the the property management company is really a key part of delivering and keeping the promise to these communities and if you get lucky, you get a great property manager. If if not, you need to do it yourself. So I will roll out in areas when I've got when I can keep the promise to my communities and my residents, um, and we have a formula for that. So the pandemic seems to have upended housing. People realize they don't want to live very far away from where they work. They don't want a long commute. 
housing closer to employment centers tend to be much pricier. What's the impact of the pandemic been on Promise Homes and how are you operating in what appears to be a somewhat new environment? So you just, I'm smiling because you just hit on a, a genius part of America's um, untapped business plan. It, and it comes from discrimination. Uh, where is the inner city in France? Paris. Where is an inner city in the UK? London. You can, go to, you can do this all day. Where is an inner city in um, Los Angeles, South Central? 15 minutes from the port, 15 minutes from the beach, 15 minutes from downtown, 10 minutes from jobs. But who lives there? We put inner city, poor, poor struggling mm-hmm. people, because we, because in the, in the 50s and 60s and 40s, people wanted to get away from these folks. They built suburbs right. when traffic was not uh, onerous and moved away. Now traffic is a pain in the gazonga beans, <laughs> and young people are not afraid of minorities. So young people are moving into inner cities at low rates, rehabbing these properties, building businesses, and creating new neighborhoods and communities. And what I want to make sure that happens is if there's going to be gentrification, let it be diverse and inclusive gentrification of folks who actually live in these neighborhoods and not just those who can afford to be in these neighborhoods. So basically you have every inner city in America, uh, with the exception of Manhattan, is a gold mine waiting to be tapped. And these every, every these are all these neighborhoods, inner city Detroit, inner, I mean, you pick one, it's right near jobs and or at least economic opportunity and energy waiting to be explored. I, I see opportunity everywhere huh. it's a guy who went to africa selling shoes he wired back three weeks later boss please send me home no one here wears shoes then they bring barry and john out there and we get lost in the bush and no one hears from us because we're exploring the culture and all that stuff and then three weeks later send more shoes. there you go barry everybody send hears ev- barefoot Great send market. every shoe you've got no one here wears <laughs> shoes that's amazing. Uh, let's talk about a few of your older books before we get to your most recent one. The Memo, Five Rules for Your Economic Liberation. What are the five rules? And I have a feeling I have an idea what those five pillars are because you've talked about those. But but what are the five rules for economic liberation? Well, you know, let's talk a little bit about why the book was even necessary. Sure. Um, uh, who didn't get the memo? I mean, what what is a memo? I mean, when you think about being at Bloomberg, you know, are we open on 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 Christmas or are we open on you know Thanksgiving? That's a memo that goes around. Everybody's on the same page. Right. Um, what happens if no one sends that memo? Do you either show up for work or don't know? You know, there's no there's no direction of what. Uh, the leadership wants to do or not to do, and so you're sort of on your own. So everybody needs a memo, and everybody needs a business plan for their life. And what we found is that after slavery, we were told, African Americans, we were free, but nobody gave us a memo on the rules of freedom in a free enterprise democracy, Mm -hmm. a, a free enterprise system. And so it's what you don't know that you don't know <laughs> that's killing you and a blind town on one-eyed man's king. Right. And when you don't know better, you can't do better. So we just found that um, you had to literally go back to the drawing board and deliver the business plan for a free enterprise success story to successive generations of people who were not giving direction or guidance. And my goal at Operation Hope was to do that through coaching, but also my goal um, in the books was to provide literal training grounds, if you want to call it that, um, so that there was no guesswork anymore around success. Um, And uh, each of the books are a bit of touch tones, um, and maybe obvious, but common sense is not so common. So, so let's go over. Let's start with the five rules. What are the five rules that we want to get out from num- people? Rule number one: You live in a free enterprise system. Embrace this. So, <laughs> people say, "Oh, I hate rich people." No, you don't. 
you hate rich people until you become rich. Right. <laughs> oh, we're socialists. No, 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 no. As my friend, late, the late Shimon Perez said to me, uh, he said, John, even if folks want to distribute money like a socialist, they have to first collect money like a capitalist. Right. So we're all living in a capitalist system. If you're going to work and using your um, talents to get a paycheck, you're using your human capital. So let's stop playing a game. Let's understand that our freedoms aren't free and we live in a free enterprise democracy. So that's number one is li you live in a free enterprise system and braces. Let's not playing this stupid game that somehow we don't. Number two, are these kids who, who are railing against capitalism and free enterprise, these rich kids who are only able to do that on a college campus because their parents are capitalists <laughs> and could send them to the best colleges in the world. It's absolutely uh, fascinating to me. Number two, so it's not just poor people who are, who are under a misnomer. Right. It's rich kids too. Number two, your mind... Uh, uh, set makes you lose money or build wealth. You choose. Number three, relationships are investments. Build relationship capital with yourself first. That's that self-esteem piece. Mm -hmm. Number four, be entrepreneurial. Don't just get a job. Maybe create one. Uh, so you can write that check, not just cash it. Number four, spiritual capital is a start of true wealth. Own your power. So I would say that we're not living, we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. Energy matters. And the most important thing in life probably is becoming reasonably comfortable in your own skin. When I met you, instantly I could tell that Barry was cool with Barry. Well, if you're cool with you, then you'll be cool with me. That makes a lot of sense. Let, let's talk about uh, another of your books. I love the title of this, and I'm really curious as to to how this can be done, how the poor can save capitalism. It always has. <laughs> it all, always has. Of course. All it, tell us more. All I, and I say this, by the way, mm. as someone who grew up pretty hard scrabble, had a, you know, always had a job since I was you know, 10, 12 years old, put myself through school, never thought about capitalism till much later in life, till I was out of college. Yes. How can the poor save capitalism? Uh, like I said, it always has. Um, How has it in the past? Give us some examples. All of the creators of wealth in this country, legitimate wealth, came from poverty. In the 20th century, um, you think about all these innovators who created companies. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned earlier, this is a good example because it's visual here in Manhattan, you have a tower that says Goldman Sachs. Mm -hmm. Well, a hundred plus years ago, there was a guy who was an immigrant named Goldman and another guy named, who was an immigrant named Sachs, and they literally were walking door to door selling financial services right. out of a briefcase because they couldn't get a job in the office towers that day because of discrimination. Right. So they had to go create their own job because no one would hire them for an existing job, and that created an institution today that people think is hotty toddy and hard to access called Goldman Sachs, but whether it's UPS and uh, I think his name was Kelly, I think it's his name, uh, who founded the UPS on a, with a bicycle messenger service, or whether it's Coca-Cola, which is a pharmacist, and his son who created that business, and they were dead broke, sold it for 500 bucks, by the way, so the, mm -hmm. pharma the pharmacy uh, formula. Uh, you can go on and on and on. You know, Black Enterprise uh, was created by uh, a hard scrabble black entrepreneur, Ebony Magazine, the guy borrowed a few bucks from his mother. Uh, so it's black entrepreneurs, Latino entrepreneurs, white entrepreneurs, it doesn't matter. All legitimate wealth, came from nothing, who built something into something, and these are big companies were once small ones. And uh, that's just a historical fact. Uh, Silicon so look, let's talk about mm -hmm. looking forward. Are, are you suggesting that we need um, the poor to continue this process of entrepreneurship and building businesses and creating something from practically nothing? Is that, I'll, is go that one, I'll go one step further. My rich friends need my poor friends in order to stay rich. My rich friends eat my poor friends to do better. Explain this. 70% of the U.S. economy is consumer spending. Mm -hmm. That's the guy who's cleaning this uh, office building, paying rent, paying a car note, buying some food on the corner, paying for uh, a, a parking ticket, uh, going to a restaurant every now and then with his wife. Uh, if without this activity, the economy comes to a grinding stop. Think about the pandemic. Think about what happened in March of 2020. Everything froze. Everything froze because the average human being was not out you know, engaging in the economy. So rich people cannot on their own 
sustain the largest economy on the planet. We literally need each other. So whether you're a consumer or whether you're a stakeholder and a builder, you have a role to play. And I'll say something else is maybe shocking. To me, it's common sense. Demographics are destiny. The reason I believe in this business plan today that it's about mission and money and morals today, there's not enough college-educated white men to grow the economy for the next 30 or 40 years. It's just, it's just mathematically impossible. Mm-hmm. So you need minorities. You need women. We need other people to grow into the economy in a sustainable way in order to keep this thing, this party, and this beautiful story of America going and so that China does not get its way of illegitimately uh, – becoming the leader of the world by cheating at capitalism and free enterprise with their partner, Russia, which is, by the way, a rounding error economically and a bunch mm-hmm. of thugs who can't do anything legitimately. But China and Russia together want our way of life. They want to be us, and they can't do it with a fair fight. We, if we realize we're better together, probably my next book, by the way, this topic, if we realize we're better together and that two plus two has to equal more than four, I mean, that's every good marriage, is that two plus two equals six, eight, or 10, you're better together, then you can realize that, that that you can't succeed if there's a hole in my end of our boat. <laughs> like we're we're in the same boat. So we need the bottom of the pyramid to be rehabilitated and engaged in the economy to grow GDP by an extra two to three percent sustainably. And black folks are a one point five trillion dollar consumer spending force, Barry. Mm-hmm. That's one of the largest economies in the world. But we don't own anything. We spend. We've got to move from just being a consumer to a wealth creator. Huh. Let's talk about your most recent book, Up From Nothing, the untold story of how we all succeed. Tell us a little bit about that. It's my failures. Um, it's it's I mean I I, it's everything. It's all my trips, my failings, my fallings, my people who who laughed at me, people who rolled their eyes at me, uh, folks who dismissed me. Um, first, the world will ignore you. Then they'll criticize you. Then they'll try to copy you. Then you win. Mm. That's that was that was my message. And I'm just trying to get a whole generation of leaders to understand that just because somebody, the lack of, of preparation in somebody else's life does not constitute an emergency in yours. And just because you don't respect me doesn't mean I don't respect myself. And, and your interpretation of my value is not my reality of my value. And when we start understanding that we are uh, unique in this world and we, are, uh, and we are powerful in that uniqueness in that eagles don't fly in packs, Barry. You've never seen a flock of eagles. But buzzers love packs. And turkeys got wings and can't fly. And if you're not careful, you'll get so offended by what turkey, what buzzards say about you, or you'll be so distracted by what uh, turkeys are laughing at you and saying about you and your family that you'll get distracted, come out, get out of your ego, your ego altitude, and you'll go down and try to show that uh, that that bird a, a lesson. And the pig will find you out in the pig pen and throw some mud on your wing and get that ego down into the mud pit. And now the the, the turkey. And the buzzard and the pig look at you and say, now we got you right where we've always wanted you, down here with us. You got to step over mess and not in it. You got to stay above the fray. You got to understand that, that, that the philosophy for success is talk without being offensive, listen without being defensive, and always leave even your adversary with their dignity. Because if you don't, they'll spend the rest of their life trying to make you miserable. It becomes personal. It, it, it is it is not their interpretation of you that matters. It is your interpretation of you that matters. Not one ounce of my self-esteem is dependent upon your acceptance of me. It just not. So so why am I spending all my time trying to impress somebody who, do, who I do not know with money I do not have in a places they do not want me with philosophies and things that theirs that don't work. They're broke. <laughs> they're they're unhappy. They're miserable. And I want to be like them? What, what, what? I want to impress them? Why are we spending our time trying to impress somebody we actually even don't want to be like? Like, all these lessons of wasting time. I, can, I don't mind wasting money every now and then. Mm-hmm. I don't want you to abuse and waste my time. I'm trying in this book to short circuit time wasting and energy wasting and depression inducing activity and give you legitimate hope that you can come up from nothing in the greatest economy, and I think the greatest crea- creation of democracy, open in, open source democracy in the world, which is America. We're not perfect, but she's a country. And we, she's an idea, not a country. We can make her anything we want. And 
and that we can be part of that remaking process up from nothing. I could never be me in Germany mm-hmm. or France or China or Japan. Culturally, I just would not have gone from the bottom to the top. So, so I love the message, but let me push back a little bit. Please and do. say, <clears throat> you know, back when my parents were entering the workforce, uh, there was a decent amount of social mobility in the mm-hmm. United States. Yeah. Forget race or religion, mm-hmm. just lowest economic strata to the upper economic strata. Mm-hmm. The economic mobility, at least by the most recent measures, um, as well as the geographic mobility, both have it hasn't gone away, but it's not nearly as broad as it once was. What's your response to people who say, the American dream isn't as robust as it once was. Because small business starts stalled in 2004. And they didn't actually pick up again until after the pandemic. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, I mean, that's almost 20 years. Uh, and the, by the way, what's the largest group starting businesses post-pandemic? Millennials. Blacks. Oh, really? What's the largest super group? Amongst all other groups, mm-hmm. black women. Interesting. So now you have the group that was thought to be left back, left behind, ignored, who couldn't get the job, couldn't get the promotion, ignored in their corporate suite. Now they're not going to the corporate suite for two years. They were at home. They got some stimulus money, which they call venture capital. Right. <laughs> okay? And now they're saying, wait a minute, do I need to go back to that job? You know, well, do I need to go back and be a waiter again and, and have people coughing on me and I don't have health care and I'm not getting good tips and the, the owner doesn't really care about me? Do I really need to go to that dead-end job? Do I need to go to that boss that doesn't care? Maybe I'll create my be, be my own boss. Maybe I'll create my own way. And so now you have this surge, this super surge of the, of the thing that made America different from Europe in the first place, Barry, which was business creation. Mm-hmm. I mean, the reason we have celebrity in America is because it was our answer to bling in Europe. Bl- Europe had royalty. That was their bling. Right. We didn't have royalty. We didn't want it. But celebrity was our our desire to have something that sparkled. The real marrow of this country was the first corporation, sorry, the first, the first entity created in this country was a corporation. Mm-hmm. It was a trading corporation that then created democracy, not the other way around. Municipalities came out of trading corporations. So we are in our bones, traders, financiers, business people, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, hustlers. That is in our DNA. And every, I think, 20, 30, 50, certainly every 100 years, you need a generation of strivers who own something, own, create something, and by the way, create jobs. So have we become over-dependent upon less than 1,000 companies that employ 10,000 people or more, Fortune 500. Yes. You have all these folks going through college, wanting to go work at we're picking, Google or whatever the thing right. is, who's not hiring <laughs> or will fire you at the moment that there is an economic glitch where most of the businesses, sorry, most of the jobs in this country come from employers with less than 100 employees. Most businesses in LA, 90, 95% of all businesses have less than 100 employees. Let's drive down Manhattan and look up in these skyscrapers. That's a dentist office, four people. That's an architect, eight people. That's a law firm, twenty people. That's a you know uh, an analyst mm-hmm. firm. 20. These are small businesses. I, I called a chiropractor yesterday. He's got him and his secretary. I mean, this is what's driving the economy. So you're either going to become the business person, or you're going to work for that small business owner who probably is going to pay you more. You have more social mobility in that place than you will in some huge corporate. I'm not saying. I'm not saying, I'm saying, I'm saying don't go work for the big company. I'm saying that that's not way to made America. So let's jump to our speed round. These are the questions we ask all our guests and plow through very quickly, starting with tell us what you've been streaming these days. What's been keeping you entertained? Succession. <laughs> uh, used to be uh, Billions, um, 1828, I think is the name of the show. Uh-huh. Uh, Yellowstone, um, I, I, uh, the, I, the, nat- the latest. I mean, I, I keep watching the Matrix movies, um, uh, Ip Man, uh, which uh, most people don't uh, listening to your show probably won't know. It's a bit of a cult film, but I think everybody needs to watch Ip Man, which supposedly is a martial arts movie, but really it's a m- movie about really moral decision making and ethical. This guy, martial arts genius who 
who trained Bruce Lee but never wanted to fight. <laughs> you had to force him to fight. Now he'd whip your rear end if you if you if you forced him, but he never wanted to fight. Um, when you got the power, you don't need to use it. Uh, I spent a lot of time late at night um, on a sort of a mental vacation. Uh, I will turn on something online and have my brain completely fantasized. There's an F1. There's a series uh, on Netflix that is that that drive to uh, survive. There you go. It unpacks F1 racing. That is uh, genius. I'm, my sport is auto racing. I actually, I have a f- professional. And I'm sorry, a competitive auto racing license. So that um, is my one of my passions. A very great, great movie by Paul Newman that Paul Newman did uh, uh, called Driving. Actually, that he was a great actor, but his passion was auto racing. Mm-hmm. Is the only sport he was elegant at. He said. So anyway, that, that I can talk, I talk about things I would love to watch all day and all night. So let's talk about your mentors. You mentioned a few. Tell us who helped shape your career. Oh my God! Uh, you know, in no in no particular order: Pastor Andrew Young, Bishop T.D. Jakes, Quincy Jones. This is the moral side uh, mm-hmm. of my life. Um, uh, on the uh, on the business side, uh, again, you know, in no particular order: Michael Arrighetti, Tony Rester, Bill Rogers of Truist. Uh, I think you know Charlie Scharf at uh, Wells Fargo. We call him a mentor, but I call him a inspired friend. Uh, Jamie Dimon. Uh, uh, we don't spend a lot of time together, but I love what he's built. Great guy. Um, I've I've got so many heroes and sheroes that have that I I, I actually had to go sort of like find the roadmap because it didn't exist for me where I grew up. So I had these surrogate fathers and mothers, um, surrogate family that mm-hmm. I have literally put around me so I could map out what success looked like. I probably have 50 of these mentors and mentees, sorry, mentor, uh, heroes and sheroes who are mentors um, that have guided my path forward. Mm-hmm. A, a few of the names I just share with you. My mother, Juanita Smith, uh, amongst them. Really interesting list. Uh, let's talk about books. What are some of your favorites? What are you reading currently? Um, Mere Christianity is something I read uh, once a year uh, by C.S. Lewis. It's from the 1940s. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, the, um, um, the book The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle is something I try to – some books I read continuously over and over, over, over again. Over yeah. and over again. Um, the Seven Spiritual Laws of Success by Deepak Chopra is something I read. It's only 70 pages. It's a great primer. It's worth reading over and over again. Uh, I'm reading a book by Greenspan right now on capitalism that I think is really, really very good. I'd encourage everybody to uh, to read it. By the way, you didn't ask me this, but there's a it's a documentary that could be a great book uh, called Easy Money that just came out. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe it's actually it's even a PBS documentary. You can find it on uh, Amazon's platform, but it is fascinating. And as much as I think I understand money, it really unpacked what happened in the last 20 years. And that, that I just saw that. Sometimes you got to watch things two or three times. The Men Who Built America, uh, mm-hmm. an eight-part series. Everybody needs to watch that. The only problem I have with it is there's no blacks or browns or it's just a bunch of you know industrious white people, and that's just a misnomer that only white men built this country. Uh, that's a whole another podcast for another time. You know, we can't get in, you even can't get in the elevator in this building without a black man's invention who built the elevator. So right. we we all had a place. But these are sources of inspiration for me. Huh, really interesting list. Last two questions. What sort of advice would you give to someone coming out of school who is interested in a career in either finance or investing? Ignore the noise. There's be a lot of noise around you. Mm-hmm. Uh, there will be a lot of people around you who are not good role models, who want to party all the time, who want to have fun. There's nothing wrong with having fun. But only in the dictionary does the word success come before the word work because it's alphabetical. Um Eagles don't fly in packs. I mentioned that earlier. So, you know, you can't expect everybody to get you or understand your path. So, particularly if you're a person of color and listening to this podcast, you're going to need to to hyper-focus because your white friend with a trust fund can make all kinds of mistakes and still land on their feet. You don't, you, you know, you may have to burn the ships behind you and hit, hit, hit that beach and like a laser beam and never give up. I am consciously oblivious of all things around me that don't matter. I am very focused on what I think is super relevant. If you're hyper-focused, you're resilient, and you never give up, you actually don't have to be the smartest guy in the room. 
you, 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 you just outrun failure. And at some point you will succeed because failure is, is lazy and the, the devil is lazy and, and fraudsters are lazy. And, and if you're just not lazy, you'll succeed. Be curious. God gave you two ears and one mouth to listen twice as much as you talk. Um, be fascinated. Be super nosy. Um, be respectful. Be kind. You never know the toe you step on. Maybe connect to the rear end. You got to kiss tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, just be gracious. If you want to have a little grace, uh, show a little mercy. Hmm. Um, I, I like that line. And our final question, what do you know about the world of capitalism, entrepreneurship, and just generally the economy today that you wish you knew 30 or so years ago when you were really ramping up? Everything's about money. Everything. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, marriage was originally about unions, uh, uh, you know, uh, different royal houses or whatever, uh, depending on part of the world you're talking about, they were trying to protect their economic interests. That's why they got married. They didn't even sleep in the same beds or the same houses back in those days. It was, you know, families trying to protect each other's interests. Uh, love is important, but alignment is also important. Um, money is, in, I mean, church. Church needs, dona- needs donation. Catholic Church is one of the largest owners of land, by the way, and, and financial services in the world. I'm, I, this is not a criticism, it's a critique. I'm just saying my observation is that whatever you want requires money and or an understanding of same in order to live a life that's free. Freedom today is self-determination. You cannot have self-determination unless you have, unless you have some level of economic if all money is his freedom. That's what I'm saying. That's all. All my, So you shouldn't pursue money to control other people's freedom, slavery. But you should understand that if you have money, that no one can control yours. Huh. That's really quite intriguing. We have been speaking with John Hope Bryant, founder of Operation Hope, and a slew of other companies. If you enjoy this conversation, be sure and check out all of our previous uh, podcasts. You can find those at YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Sign up for our daily reading list at Ritholtz.com. Follow me on Twitter at Ritholtz. Follow all of the Bloomberg family of podcasts at Podcast. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team that helps with these conversations together each week. Paris Wald is my producer. Atika Valbrun is my project manager. Sean Russo is my researcher. My audio engineer is Sebastian Escobar. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio.